Hi, good evening. I'm Cheryl Holcomb McCoy, Dean of the School of Education at American University. And I just want to welcome you all uh, to our very first Big Ideas uh, speaker series. With a global health pandemic and a national reckoning on issues of race and racism, and also with significant shifts uh, to virtual learning in pre-K-12 and higher education settings, we are surely at a critical moment when big ideas are needed. To me, I always, someone asked me the other day, well, what are big ideas? And I think of big ideas as almost like linchpins that are essential because they connect the wheel to its axle and that and allows everything to move forward. Well, using that same analogy in education, we need big ideas or the linchpins to connect all of the pieces of knowledge that we do have to make high quality education accessible to all, hence the moving forward. A matter of fact, um, I was just thinking too the other day, because of our current situation due to the pandemic, um, we have accelerated our willingness to act on big ideas. And so in the School of Education at American University, we really want to be an incubator for new big ideas as we move into 2021 particularly in those areas that we specialize in, like early childhood education, special education, disability studies, teacher and school leader preparation, international and global education, and education policy and leadership. So with all of those things, who better to start us off um, with our Big Idea series than Dr. John B. King, president and CEO of Education Trust, and for the former US Secretary of Education in the Obama administration. You probably know a lot about Dr. King. Um, he is a big idea type of guy. Um, and he's big idea because, you know, lots of things happened during his administration. I won't go through the long list of all of his accomplishments, but I do want you to know that he has worked, before he worked in the US Department of Education, he was also the New York State Education Commissioner, and he began his career in education as a high school social studies teacher in Puerto Rico and Boston, and he also served as a middle school principal. So all bases covered, and I'm sure he has lots to tell us about his experiences um, that led him to some of his big ideas that he's doing now. But before we jump in with Dr. King, I want to remind everyone that Dr. Snyder, Jason Snyder, who is a faculty member in our education policy and leadership program, will facilitate the second half of our time together this evening in a Q&A portion starting around 6.30. I'm thrilled to have uh, Jason join us this evening and help facilitate that conversation. And then also a couple of other important housekeeping notes. There is no chat feature, um, no video or audio feature. All of those features are, are not working. Um, we have questions that were gathered at the time of registration. So no live question and answers tonight. However, we hope that you will share this video with your colleagues and friends, and it will be recorded and placed on our YouTube channel, um, hopefully, um, in the next couple of days. So follow us on, um, follow our website and go to our YouTube page um, to check out our videos. So with that said, I want to welcome uh, Dr. King. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for the opportunity to be a part of this event. So happy to have you here. Thanks for joining us and kicking us off. And I just want to start by, you know, it's the obvious question as we talk about big ideas and looking at, um, you know, considering the context and the moment um, with the impact of COVID, virtual learning, um, the racial reckoning that's happening in our country right now. Um, this, we seem to be at a pivotal moment in education where we have an oppor a distinct opportunity um, to change educational practices. So I really want, you know, if you can tell us a little bit about what you see as being um, some big ideas for us to move forward um, in 2021 and your dream projects um, that you have. And distinctly, now this is, a, I'm asking you a lot at once. Um, what would be, um, you know, one or two things that you think we should actually stop? You know, so big ideas, what we should keep doing or new ideas, but then what are some ideas that 
you think, or some practices that you think we should blow up or just stop? Sure, sure. Well, it's definitely big questions. Uh, you know, acknowledging that there, there are no silver bullets, right? Um, I, do there, I do think this is a moment where we should seize the opportunity to do some, some big things and to marshal the growing public sense of our deep interconnectedness. So maybe, maybe three, three big things I hope that we'll do. One is um, I think people are conscious in a new way of the importance of early childhood education. There are affluent folks who never had to worry about being without childcare before, who have now experienced firsthand how difficult it is to juggle um, not having childcare while trying to work. And so have a real appreciation for how important childcare is. Uh, I think there, this is a moment where folks have a new appreciation for science and we have a tremendous amount of science and evidence uh, about early brain development. And I would love to see us marshal that to say we're going to have universal access to high quality early childhood education, zero to four, right? And in the wealthiest country in the world, we can afford to do that. Uh, the evidence is clear that we will reap benefits in better academic preparation for K-12, better post-secondary outcomes, better long-term employment outcomes, even better long-term health outcomes, right? So that's one. Two, um, in the K-12 space, you know, this moment of national reckoning around racial justice, I think, ought to cause us to look at why we have failed even 65 years after Brown versus Board of Education to actually do what the court described in Brown versus Board of Education, right? So in, in 1954, the court said separate schools are inherently unequal. And yet today we have schools that are more segregated by race and income than they were even five or 10 years ago. And on the whole, as a country, we've gone backwards on integration since the 80s. So this ought to be a moment where we say, no, actually, it is good for academic outcomes for students to go to racially diverse schools. But more than that, it's good for civic outcomes. We need all of our young people, our Black young people, Latino young people, Asian American young people, white young people, Native American young people. We need all of our young people to have the experience of interacting with peers who are different from them and interacting with teachers who, some of whom are different from them, some of whom reflect them, right? So this should be a moment where we truly fulfill the vision of Brown. We start thinking about what can we do to move towards racially and socioeconomic integrated schools? And what can we do to diversify our educator workforce? The majority of our kids are kids of color. What's that? I was gonna ask you, you know, I've always been intrigued about, you know, the resegregation of schools mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. what, are what 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 do you think keeps us from uh, what are those barriers? I mean, we tried busing um, mm -hmm. as a policy mm -hmm. um, to integrate schools, um, but what and and many of the those uh, busing policies and states have been lifted, so there is no forced sort of integration anymore. What do you think? Um, you know, as far as what sh what can we do to incentivize? Um, the integration of schools as you talk, because we know the outcomes are better when schools right. are integrated. Right. What, what are some of the ideas about how, did, how do we get there? Well, we proposed in the Obama administration a federal funding source to incentivize school integration. It would have provided funding for things like the creation of um, innovative schools that might draw students across district lines or neighborhood lines. You know, you think about in DC, how um, students are so eager to go to the art school that even students who live in surrounding suburban communities will lie and say they live in DC so they can go to the art school, right? So uh, arts, STEM, many communities career and technical education programs that are regional are among the most diverse programs. So one thing would be to create programs that would draw students across those lines of race and class. Another strategy would be to think about school siting decisions and grade level configurations. So you might have 
two segregated K-5 schools, right? One heavily made up of white affluent students, the other heavily made up of low-income students of color. You could instead, if they're in relatively close proximity, have a K-2 school that was integrated and a 3-5 school that was integrated. In many cases, when you do the analysis on school assignment patterns, the school assignment patterns are incredibly gerrymandered, more gerrymandered than the most gerrymandered congressional district. They're set up to separate. You know, in New York City, in central Brooklyn, where I grew up, uh, you can be just blocks between two schools and have radically different student populations. And there isn't an intentional effort to try to advance integration. Mm -hmm. There are housing policies that matter. I live in Montgomery County, Maryland. Montgomery County has a long history of intentional uh, mixed income housing development. I live on a block with private family homes, but on our corner are a number of apartment buildings that are mixed income. And so the result is uh, the schools that, that my kids have attended are racially and socioeconomically integrated. Uh, so there are a lot of ways you could incentivize uh, integration. You also need a robust civil rights enforcement strategy to block those things that would exacerbate segregation. We're seeing a phenomenon now in, in many places of districts where the, the white affluent parts of the district are trying to secede from the district to create a separate district to reduce integration, right? We ought to have civil rights enforcement to prevent that kind of thing. So. There's definitely work we could do to advance integration. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the third piece I'll raise is um, the truth of the matter is in, in the 21st century economy, um, post-secondary education is a must. Now it doesn't necessarily need to be a four-year college degree. It might be an associate's degree. It might be uh, post-secondary career training. There are very few good jobs that pay a family sustaining wage that you can get without post-secondary education. And again, in the wealthiest country in the world, we have the resources to say to every young person, we're going to invest in you. So we ought to double Pell Grants. We ought to have a federal state partnership that makes it possible for students to go to college debt free. That is achievable uh, if we had the political will. So if you had quality zero to four educational opportunities, a racially and socioeconomically diverse K-12 experience, and then universal access to post-secondary education, well, now you'd be talking about the foundation for a much more resilient, just, and prosperous future for the country. And again, all of that is achievable if we have the political will. And we have such great research in each of those areas that, you know, Absolutely. really can guide us to, so it goes back to that, you know, those linchpins, like connecting all of those things. Do you know of any places that have been really trying to connect like the early childhood education, uh, post-secondary, all of those different pieces that you're talking about? Who's doing not, that? Well? Not, not at the level, we, you know, as, as is often the case in American education, we're such a decentralized system um, you know, 13,000 school districts all going in their own direction. So we, we often have uh, kind of shoots of green. We have individual bright spots, but we don't have scaled solutions. Uh, so we have, uh, for example, programs like uh, PTEC in New York City, where you have a partnership between IBM, New York City Department of Education, City University of New York, and students at the PTEC high school graduate with a high school diploma, an associate's degree, first in line for a job at IBM. And the school's been around long enough now they have graduates who are working full time as engineers at IBM. And that program has been replicated in 15 different, at least 15 different uh, sites around New York State with different employer partners. It's been replicated in Chicago, in uh, Colorado. So, that's very promising, but we are not seeing that at scale. Um, you know, we have places that have committed to universal pre-K. Actually, New York City stood up rather quickly, um, you know, near universal access to pre-K for four-year-olds. Washington, D.C., for sure, has now a long history of uh, universal access to pre-K. And I, I would argue that it's, it's keeping folks staying in DC who might've moved out of the city, 
um, but they're choosing to stay because they want those pre-K programs for their kids. There's also good evidence that's increased workforce participation uh, by women because of the availability of reliable quality childcare. So, you know, those are again, shoots of green, but we, we haven't seen the kind of work we need at scale. Great. And from a, you know, there are lots on lots of students online now, um, students that are doing research or preparing to be teachers or school leaders, policymakers. What would you say to them about what are those really important things that they should remember as they're moving forward, um, mm. given everything that you've just mm. said? Mm. Wow. Well, you know, two things that come to mind, especially in this moment. One is to be conscious of how intersectional and intersectoral these issues are. You know, that um, the child who's hungry is gonna to struggle to learn. The child who doesn't have glasses but needs them is gonna to struggle to see the board, right? The child who is uh, experiencing homelessness is going to have uh, greater socio-emotional needs. So, as educators, we have to be conscious of these multiple um, identities and the interaction between sectors that impact kids' school experience. And I don't know that we've always done a good job in the education sector of having that awareness. And sometimes we get into this false dichotomy where we say all that matters is what happens in school and what happens at home is irrelevant. Or other people argue, well, the only thing that matters is the kids' home situation and there's nothing we can do in school. And I think both of those views are wrong. We've got to have great instruction and great engagement and great relationships at school. And we've got to think about how we address all the other forces in kids' lives, how we engage their parents effectively, how we partner with communities. Yeah. The second, all, all there together. I mean, exactly, a former exactly. counselor, it's like it's so good to hear that because you can't stop the school from the community. Or what you know, it's all one. That's right. That's right. Like, yeah. And then the second piece that I that, and maybe this is a bit provocative, but um, you know, this spring after the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery, you had all these institutions higher ed, school districts, corporations, foundations, putting out these statements of solidarity with, with Black Lives Matter and with the protests and saying they were committed to racial justice. And there's a huge gap between those statements and the actions. So you have higher ed institutions that said, yeah, we believe Black Lives Matter, but they don't have Black students. You had school districts saying, yeah, we believe Black Lives Matter, but they don't have Black teachers, right? You had uh, foundations saying, we, we, we believe Black Lives Matter, but they don't fund Black-led organizations. So there's this just this gap between the, the rhetoric and the reality. And I think it's incumbent on all of us to see part of our role as closing that gap. And it's true at the institutional level where we've got to say, you know, in our school district, we believe all children can learn. Are we living that out, right? Are we making sure every child has access to opportunity? In our country, we say we believe in equality of opportunity, but we're not really providing it fully. Uh, we say there's equal justice under the law, but we're not really doing that fully. And I think our sort of moral responsibility is to try to close that values reality gap and to keep reminding ourselves that we are inheritors of a proud tradition of that, right? When I think about John Lewis marching across the Edmund Pettus Bridge and risking his life to, to protect and advance equitable access to the ballot, right? That's John Lewis insisting that we close that values reality gap. You know, or Thurgood Marshall arguing for Brown and the Brown outcome in the Supreme Court, that's pushing for that closing of the values reality gap. And the same is true of the, you know, the social studies teacher who's saying, you know, I'm gonna make sure we learn about reconstruction and how the reaction against reconstruction led to 
the imposition of Jim Crow and some of the parallels in modern times to sliding backwards after we make social progress. And like that, that's a teacher in her classroom trying to bridge that, that values reality gap. Yeah. The power of teaching, right? And the power of acting. I mean, this shift to being not just performative, but actually acting. Yes. Um, and That's right. And teachers are um, change agents. I mean, this is if you want to change the world, teach. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is. Mm -hmm. It is a. It is um, a powerful position. You know. You. You know. As you're talking about anti-racism, because you know we've been. You know, as a school of education, um, we com committed ourselves to this summer. Um, after the killing of George Floyd, um, our faculty and staff and students came together and said, we want to create an anti-racist learning community, mm -hmm. which is a, that's a tough job. I mean, that's not, because that is pushing back on society inherently is racist, we believe. And so it really is us, um, you know, taking a stand and pushing back on oppressive practices that happen in education and that happen on university campuses. Mm -hmm. um, it's a strong commitment. We're ready for it, but it's, it's a lot of work. Um, you, and this is a little bit more personal because it's related to you and your journey to understand race and racism and your own personal journey by visiting, um, I read about it in the Washington Post, visiting uh, your dis the descendants of the slaveholders of your great grandfather um, in Maryland. And I just wanted, you know, I'm just real, I found it fascinating um, that you were able to do that. Some of us, you know, we dream of being able to go back mm -hmm. and really understanding mm -hmm. our ancestry in that way. How has that affected you that um, the ability to do that, has, how has that affected your understanding of issues of race, racism in education? Yeah, well, it's been a, you know, it's been a profound journey, right, to both to come to understand that my great grandfather was enslaved not 25 miles from where I live here in Montgomery County. Wow. To go to the property and the property when you when you when you go on to the property, which is in Gaithersburg, it, it is like you're transported to the 1860s because the, the property really has been maintained. Uh, the the the, the house uh, that was occupied by the folks who owned my family is still the house that is occupied by their descendants. And it is the house that was constructed in the 1700s. The cabin where my great grandfather and his family lived as enslaved people still standing on the property. Uh, there is a, a unmarked enslaved people's burial ground on, on the property, still a working farm. So being in that cabin, you know, I'm very conscious of the debt I owe to my ancestors who lived for a future they could not see, right? Who were able to withstand the horrors of this institution with a faith in a future that, that in some ways was unimaginable. But, but there was this belief in, in, in pressing forward. And, and, and I, I, am, I and my family are getting to, to, to live the lives we do because, because they uh, per persevered in that way. I was struck in, in getting to know the family that are descendants of the folks who own my family. Uh, struck really by two lessons. One, around education that I think for them, this has been such an experience of coming to understand more about their ancestors and about the institution of slavery. You know, we had these difficult conversations about, you know, why we say enslaved people rather than slaves, right? Um, had these difficult conversations about why we feel the way we do about Confederate statues, even though their ancestors, as was often the case in Maryland, their ancestors actually went and served with the Confederacy, even though. Maryland stayed on the side of the Union. Many, uh, many folks from Maryland actually went to, to fight with the Confederacy as their ancestors did. And so we had difficult conversations about monuments and what they mean. Um, and so I was struck that, that the education system hadn't necessarily created opportunities for them to have those conversations, but we're having those conversations now. Mm -hmm. But the other lesson for me is 
you know, there's so many things to be mad about, about this current moment and so many injustices and so many ways that the issues we're struggling with today are an extension of 400 years of anti-Blackness in our history. Right. right. And in three generations, my family has gone from being enslaved on that property to serving the cabinet of the first Black president. Wow. That's extraordinary, that is. right? And so one has to draw a sense of hope about America and what is possible if we make America more true to principles of democracy and equality. I just had goosebumps when you said that because really um, that is remarkable. And as, you know, as Bettina Love talks about, you know, within the pain of racial injustice, we mm -hmm. find joy. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. joy and the resilience of being able mm -hmm. to withstand all of that, right? And it's just, right. it it just brings me. We need to celebrate that more often. That's right. Oh, okay, That's so right. I have one minute. We have one minute, and I want you to tell me about Strong Future Maryland because that is something that you're doing. You said it was a hobby. I think it's just <laughs> it's huge. But can you tell us in one minute or so, because I'm going to turn it over to Jason and you can talk about yeah. it more with him, but tell us a little bit about Strong Future Maryland. Yeah. Well, look, in my, you know, in my day job, I work on education <laughs> issues. I'm very passionate about it, about education equity. But I, as I said, I'm, I've, you know, always become more and more, and more conscious of the, of the ways in which issues of economic injustice interact with education, the ways in which um, issues of criminal justice reform interact with education. And, and in this moment of COVID, I'm very conscious that we are in a real equity crisis. You know, think about the fact that since COVID, the 650 wealthiest billionaires in the country, they are $900 billion richer since COVID. Meanwhile, we have 14 million kids who are food insecure, right? So COVID has really um, put a spotlight on these deep inequities. And to my mind, it is not good enough to just go back to how things were before COVID. We have got to build a future that is uh, more resilient, more just, more equitable. And so the idea behind Strong Future Maryland was to say, we're gonna work on broad-based economic development, strengthening the social safety net, uh, investing in education, K-12 and higher ed, uh, including our HBCUs in Maryland. We're gonna work on tackling the, the, the challenge scientists are now warning us about as a next challenge in climate change and doing that in a way that creates green jobs and economic opportunity in the state. And that we can make this really a new deal moment for the state where we emerge from COVID a better, uh, community, a stronger community. And so that, that's the idea behind it. So we're, we're doing organizing work and really trying to build a movement for progressive change in the state. Uh, so it's not my day job. It's my, you know, <laughs> nights and weekends job, but it, but it, but I'm very passionate about it because I, you know, this is my community. My kids are in Montgomery County schools and, uh, you know, my family's history in, in, in this land is quite long and we, and, and, yeah. and we, we need to do all we can to, to emerge from this moment. Um, well, I would love for justice. You, we would love for you to come back and tell us more about, I'm sure there, we have lots of students and um, faculty and staff who would love to become more involved in that movement because many of them live in Maryland and even living in DC, you can still um, right. participate. So we would love to hear more about that. But on that note, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague um, Dr. Jason Snyder. Great. Thank, thank you for the conversation. And, and Strong Future MD is there. The, you go. Uh, strong uh, Future uh, MD. All yes, right. we put Got that in the, into and uh, strongfutureMD.org. You will find right. us. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, Maryland is lucky to have you, Dr. King, I'll have to say for sure. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, for everyone who doesn't know me, I'm Jason Snyder, a faculty member here at uh, AU, uh, teaching education law and education policy. And I just want to thank you, Dr. King, again, for uh, joining us in, in this important conversation about big ideas in education. And I got to also say that our country, our country students are really so fortunate that even after leaving all your time of service in public service and federal and state government, that you're continuing the fight 
um, for quality and edu uh, of education and equity as, as leader of education trust and now also strong future Maryland. So I, I, you know, I was lucky enough, I got a chance to work with you when I was at the department and you were state chief and, and uh, what stood out, I mean, was not only your relentless focus on, on children, but what it was also your ability to solve problems. And that's what we need right now is people who can solve problems. And, and you, whether it was like supporting the implementation of a program like school improvement or um, brokering agreements between labor and management, which you did a lot of as well too. I mean, a lot of it came down to the policy implementation. And, 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 and as we try to teach our students here at, at, um, at AU, and you've been living it, our, our policy students, we try to teach them that policy implementation is equally more important than policy development. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I know no one better than you who's been doing that in the field. So we're, uh, we're lucky to have you again tonight. I'm also lucky that I get to ask you some questions from the attendees. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna start off with one that came from one of, uh, one of our attendees here. Um, and uh, the question was, um, when you became Secretary of Education, and I kind of saw your transition into there, what was your primary goal? What, what obstacles did you face trying to achieve that goal? And, um, and then what were your biggest rewards while you were Secretary of Education? Yeah. Um, well, probably not surprisingly, you know, my, my, my goal was to, was to advance education equity, right? I mean, to my mind, that is what the Federal Education Department exists to do. If you go back to the original sort of federal, uh, the origins of the federal role in education really rests with the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965, which was a civil rights law and reflected Lyndon Johnson's belief as a former teacher uh, that there was a federal role to play in advancing education equity. And, and the department, when it was created, um, was created with, with that in mind in, at, at the end of the Carter administration. And, and um, that's, that's the spirit with which that we tried to approach the work. You know, there were, and I'll start with some of the, the more hopeful side, the, you know, there were these amazing moments of being able to advance equity uh, from the department. I think about, you know, a program that I loved where in, in the 94 crime bell, one of the many misguided policies in 94 crime bill was banning Pell Grant access for folks who are incarcerated. Mm -hmm. And we were able at the end of the Obama administration to create a pilot program to allow folks who are incarcerated to access Pell Grants to be able to pursue higher ed while incarcerated. And that pilot has actually grown over the last few years. And we now have bipartisan momentum in Congress, I hope in the next Congress to repeal that ban, but to visit prisons since, you know, the administration and talk with students who had access to education because of work that we did, so powerful. Uh, we put out guidance, which the current administration uh, withdrew, but we put out guidance on the protection of, of rights for transgender students. And, you know, I've talked with families and young people all over the country who felt seen by the federal government for the first time because of that guidance. And even though the, the Trump administration withdrew it, it, it helped move the conversation forward in the country around protecting the rights of LGBTQ young people. Yeah, and the, the courts too. I mean, that's the, right. the fourth circuit right now, it's that, a, it would be appealed to the Supreme Court, but uh, ruled in favor of transgender students, both that's on right. uh, Title IX and, and the Equal Protection Clause. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, the, the the ability, I mean, that, that to me is one of, one of the great satisfactions. I know you felt this when you were working at the department to be able to use that platform to advance uh, opportunity for young people. It's just, it's just profound. So that was, the, that was satisfying. Frustrating mm -hmm. uh, for sure. And I know you felt this as well, was the resistance we experienced in Congress to moving our agenda forward. So, you know, we proposed a significant investment in early childhood that would have provided access to pre-K for low and middle income families, rejected by Congress. We proposed uh, making community college tuition free and a series of reforms to try to improve community college outcomes, rejected by Congress. I mentioned earlier, we proposed funding for school integration, rejected by Congress. Um, you know, it was a very partisan time, 
Uh, but it was frustrating that we couldn't move those those big ideas, and you know we'll see how things proceed o- over in the in the future. But my hope is we will eventually advance those ideas because they were the right ideas. I mean, one of the things that you, you were able to advance was uh, was uh, the Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we got a bunch of questions from our attendees about accountability generally. Mm-hmm. And, and I know you and your team at Education Trust have been doing you know, incredible work monitoring the states on ESSAs and looking at the plans. In fact, one of our education policy and leadership uh, a set of students cohort from our, uh, a few years back worked with your teams and helped uh, review some of the plans and you guys are doing great work there and we what I remember seeing from your ed trust reviews is that some of the states have been producing watered down accountability systems and uh, including sometimes like really hiding those achievement and opportunity gaps yeah. right yeah and and so given given us as flexibility for the states around accountability and the department's approval, at least the current administration's department's approval of the low quality, and some low quality state plans, let's say. Do you think the federal government still has a meaningful role in accountability? Yes, uh, you know, but it certainly depends on who's leading at the federal level. I, you know, we, we should, the structure of ESSA really tried to, as you said, give more flexibility to states, but the idea was that the federal education department would serve as a, uh, a backstop, a safeguard right. for um, equity and civil rights considerations. So you'd say to a state, well, if you want to broaden the definition of educational excellence beyond English, math, and high school graduation, great. You want to bring in science and social studies. You want to bring in post-secondary outcomes and linking K-12 to uh, post-secondary matriculation and persistence. Fantastic those measures have to be real, they have to be rigorous, they have to be valid, they have to be comparable, and we'll work with you to make sure that happens. But the idea was that the the federal education department would make sure the measures were real and good and substantive and the data were disaggregated by race and income. And what we've had in the current administration is a real abdication of that responsibility and it's sort of a, you know, send us anything, we'll rubber stamp it. And the result is we're missing that federal state partnership we envisioned. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could imagine a future administration, and this isn't a, a partisan point. Um, you know, I think Margaret Spellings, who was uh, George W. Bush's Secretary of Education, and, and Ron Page, who was, who was George W. Bush's other Secretary of Education, they would agree with exactly this that the federal government should be a safeguard on civil rights protections and meaningful accountability. And it's just the current administration isn't playing that role. Does that mean that the, um, given um, that backstop is dependent on who's in charge, it sounds like, does that mean that you think that there is, that the, the, is the flexibility then a, a, a bad choice from a policy perspective for accountability then? No, I, I, I still think the flexibility is valuable in part because I, th- I think we've got to learn and, and you know, Uh, part of the benefits of a federal system is that you could have states innovating. So you could imagine Mm -hmm. a state, well, we have one one real good example is Louisiana. Louisiana looked at their reading assessment and said, you know what, what we'd like to do, rather than just having students read passages that are disconnected from any intentional sequencing of content knowledge, we think content knowledge is really important to becoming a good reader. So we're gonna embed our social studies standards in our English language arts assessment. So kids will each year have passages that are tied to the social studies content for that year, in addition to other passages that are in a broader you know, set of areas. I thought that was really interesting. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm yeah. not ready to say everybody should do that all at once. But that's really interesting. And we ought to have room for states to be able to do something like that. Or you might have a state saying, you know, we're gonna look really hard at our career and technical education credentials and try to link accountability for high schools to whether or not students get those credentials and whether or not those credentials are accepted by employers and lead to good jobs. That's really interesting. I don't know that we're ready to scale that to the whole country, but it'd be great if a state was experimenting in that way. 
So that I still think there's value to the flexibility that we built in. Um, but, you know, elections have consequences. Right, right. Because we just found some of that about uh, with the uh, Supreme Court, too, here. Um, uh, Dr. King, we have a lot of also um, teachers, probably, who are, um, uh, you know, uh, watching right now and for people training to be teachers, both. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions that came from one of our attendees was, uh, is there's a significant teacher and administrator shortage in the United States? Do you think there are, what do you think are some of the reasons why this is the case and, and what are tangible and realistic steps that can be taken to really ensure that all students have a highly effective educator yeah. in the front of the classroom? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we have shortages in particular areas, right? Mm -hmm. So we have significant shortages in uh, STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. We have shortages in bilingual, Education, we need many more bilingual educators. Shortages in teachers trained to work with students with disabilities. But in many parts of the country, we have many more elementary school graduates than we actually need. So we have a real supply demand mismatch. I would love to see the federal government and states do a lot more to incentivize people to go into those high need fields and to be willing to teach in high needs areas. We have a real challenge getting folks, for example, uh, to go to some rural communities. So we could have federal incentives around that. That's certainly what many of our international peers do. Uh, we could subsidize teacher training for folks who are willing to, to work for a number of years in high needs areas or high needs subjects. Um, we have a compensation problem in some states, not every state. Uh, you know, in Oklahoma, the teacher salaries are so low that people are moving to Texas to get better salaries. And the Texas salaries aren't that high. Now, there are other parts of the country where teacher salaries are more competitive. Uh, but we got to improve salaries to make it so that people can afford to be teachers and, and oftentimes pay off what they owe for, for their um, uh, college training. Working conditions are a big issue. You know, if you're in a school where, I'm sure you read the Detroit Right to Literacy case. Yeah, yeah, and, the Whitmer case, yeah, sure. And, you know, when you read the materials in that case, when you read the conditions in Detroit schools, you know, rodents running across the floor, water dripping from the ceiling, books from the 70s. I mean, it's, you wouldn't want your kid to be in those conditions and you wouldn't want and you wouldn't you wouldn't want your your kid to be a teacher in those conditions right and so working conditions have to be addressed that is you know tied to our willingness at the federal and state level to invest in public education particularly in our highest needs communities we also do a lot more i think on the diversity end to try to recruit folks who are paraprofessionals folks who are in community college folks who are working in other roles in schools like coaches and uh, behavior specialists and so forth to get them into teaching so that we diversify the profession. So we got a lot of work to do in this area. I'd love to see some federal leadership on it. We haven't had that. Hmm. Um, you know, in um, the, one of the other areas that we got a lot of questions on uh, Dr. King was around charter schools. And I know, I know that, um, uh, given sort of the current administration's um, uh, views on, on school choice and, and, and charters um, that I think it's often on the minds of, of our students. Um, and we all, you know, we also know that you were a successful founder and director of a charter school uh, before becoming state chief and, and a charter school uh, organization as well, uh, CML, and, and before becoming secretary of education. I also know you wrote your dissertation, by the way, uh, on how three successful charter schools closed the achievement gap. Uh, uh, and, and the reason I know that is because when I started writing my, we were about to write my dissertation, it was the first dissertation that was handed to me at Teachers College <laughs> was yours to read and you said, do it like this is what they said. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm curious though, because uh, we did receive a bunch of questions on charter schools as well. What do you think traditional charter public schools can learn from charter schools? And I would say vice versa, both of those. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, as a general matter, I think there, there are some great things happening in charter schools and district schools, and there isn't enough sharing. Um, 
certainly we see a number of charters that are high performing that are doing some things that, that I think also high performing district schools serving high needs kids are doing, but we haven't seen these practices scale. Things like a longer day and longer school year, mm -hmm. uh, things like dedicated professional development time. When I was a principal, we would have teachers come back three weeks before the kids came so that we could do planning and look at the previous year student work and analyze and plan out our curriculum and collaborate across disciplines. You know, that in many districts, the teachers are due back the day before kids come. So that, that commitment to professional development time in the summer and during the school year, we organized our, our school year time so that we had dedicated professional development time every week in the building with, with our teachers. Um, we put a lot of effort into intensive tutoring, which you know has a growing body of evidence for its effectiveness. Uh, certainly, the the high performing charters are doing you know some kind of high dosage tutoring work, and often seeing the benefit of that. Um, you know, there's a I think in many of the high performing charters an intentionality about the partnership with families. Um, mm -hmm. But again, parallels what you see in high performing district schools serving uh, low income students and students of color. So there are a lot of, a lot of parallels. Uh, and actually when you put teachers together, you know, if you say, if you get a bunch of charter math teachers and district math teachers, folks just wanna talk about math and like what makes math great and how to make great math lessons. And you can break down some of that charter district divide. You know, now, now, I would say there are also terrible charters, and we should close them. And, you know, um, the way that I knew who Betsy DeVos was before she became secretary was that she um, really led in Michigan the passage and protection of a terrible charter law that allowed for a proliferation of terrible for profit charters in Michigan. I would say the charter sector in Michigan is deeply problematic and totally disconnected from what charters look like in a Massachusetts, let's say, where there's a high bar to get a charter rigorous oversight, uh, willingness to close low performing schools. Uh, so for, the, for charters to be a positive force in public education, you need rigorous oversight. Um, and you need public oversight. My, my view is public dollars in public schools uh, with public accountability. And in that context, I think charters can be a useful laboratory. We have charters in some places that are diverse by design that are doing uh, work to try to attract an intentionally diverse student population, really interesting. We have charters that are focused on kids with uh, autism, um, you know, where there's a sort of a niche community that they're serving and they're learning some important lessons on, on how to help kids be successful, charters that are focused on opportunity youth who've dropped out and can be brought back into school. But there are district schools doing those same things. I live in Montgomery County, we don't have charters, but we have a range of district options that are innovating in different ways. And so there's a lot that I think district and charter school educators can learn from each other if we can get past the politics. And speaking of the politics, a lot of the things that you mentioned um, that were maybe advantages of charter schools around flexibility of time and so other, and other things um, require some agreement with the labor unions and collective bargaining. And is there, uh, I know there's no silver bullet there either, but is there an approach that seems to make sense to allow for those sort of additional initiatives that you, that you mentioned? Yeah, I mean, I think when you look across the country, um, one thing that helps is trust, right? That's sort of foundational. And do labor and management trust each other? That's personal trust, but also institutional trust. Um, oftentimes where we've seen successful efforts to kind of innovate within a collective bargaining context has been when there's additional salary increases on the table, right. because then you're able to say, look, we, we want you to be well compensated. And as part of that, we want to create a career ladder model where 
uh, teachers who've been very successful are able to coach their peers. And in, in, and in many places around the country, labor has said, yeah, okay, we can do that because we're gonna, we're gonna improve our compensation overall. People are gonna get closer to where, they, where others with similar education and training are in our economy. And yes, as part of that, we're willing to innovate around career ladders, or we're willing to innovate around schedules. You know, there have been a few states where there's been efforts to do expanded school day time, right? Together with bargaining units, but by putting more resources on the table. Um, you know, to be bipartisan, I will, I will quote uh, Margaret Spellings, who mm -hmm. you know would say, "Resources." plus reform equals results. Right. Pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I worked in that for a few months before, you know, in the White House Fellows before coming over to work with uh, with uh, Arnie and, and uh, the Obama administration. And yeah, she had, I think she had, had something there for sure. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The resource, it's the, tr it's, it's the, it's the, I'll, I'll give you this, the resources and you'll get, in return, we'll get some more flexibility or some more, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, some more options there in the scheduling and so on. Um, so just turning, I think, to one more topic then, Dr. King, and, and this is also on everyone's mind, of course, and you, we talked about it just a little bit at the beginning, but um, COVID now, and, yeah. and, and, um, and I, um, you know, I think one thing that we are, um, uh, what we're seeing right now is that there is, um, uh, there, there's a lot of concern, obviously, about the, how students are suffering academically and social emotionally um, uh, because of COVID, exacerbating inequities right now in the education system. Um, but many families, teachers, and teacher unions are concerned about sending their kids back to school in person. And um, and speaking of teacher unions, they're playing a bigger role in this as, just as well too right now um, in, in trying to protect uh, their membership. You, as a former uh, state chief, what would be your advice to superintendents right now in school openings? Because you were still in New York, I guess. Yeah. Um, what yeah. would you say? What would you do, or what would you do? Well, you know, it's worth saying at the outset that we've we put the country has left school district leaders, state leaders in just a terrible position. It did not have to be this way. Yeah. There were. Uh, a series of terrible misjudgments on the part of the federal government that led us here, right? If we had had a robust testing and contact tracing strategy, if we had had a robust quarantine strategy, if we had had disciplined adherence to the science at the outset, we wouldn't be in this situation. Because you can't separate school districts from the reality of community spread. And where there's tremendous community spread, can't have school. I mean, that, that's, that's the reality. I think it would have been helpful for the federal government to provide much clearer guidance on how to think about community spread and what is a low enough rate of community spread to consider reopening schools and then at what kind of um, sort of level of increase would you need to close back down and return to virtual. They never, they never created that sort of coherent guidance we need that still. So states need to provide that, right? So that districts have some parameters for thinking about this. Some states have done a better job than others at providing that. Um, states need, need to provide resources to districts to be able to get the PPE that they need, right? The personal protective equipment, but they also need in some cases to improve ventilation in school mm -hmm. buildings. Uh, we know a lot now about how the, the uh, coronavirus travels and bad ventilation is a recipe for folks getting sick. So we need to improve ventilation. Uh, we need adequate resources to deploy staffing so that we can have effective uh, hybrid models where we limit the number of students in the building and we, where we are protecting uh, teachers, students, and their families. You know, there's, I think, growing evidence that there may be differences between elementary and high school in terms of the likelihood that kids will spread COVID. Um, and so we may think differently about who comes back first uh, and under what conditions. And we might spread elementary school students out over 
more buildings and allow high school students to continue virtual for longer, those kinds mm -hmm. of things. But I guess the overarching point I would make is we are in an environment where there's such a deficit of trust in government. And we see it in polling that we've done at Ed Trust. We see particularly among low-income parents and Black and Latino parents, real skepticism about sending their kids back to school. Despite the fact that Black and Latino folks are much more likely to have to work outside of the home. So there's real economic trade-offs, but they're still distrustful of the institutions because look what's happened in terms of the devastation of COVID. You know, Black and Latino folks are three times as likely to get COVID, twice as likely to die from COVID when they do. Folks know people who have died from COVID. They know people who are seeing long-term negative health impacts. And so there is this fear. So part of the challenge now for the federal government is to restore trust. And that distrust is in ex exacerbating the inequities as well too right now then. Is 100%. What, is what, yeah. 100%. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing a place like New York City that low-income folks and Black and Latino parents are less likely to be willing to send their kids back to school, um, even though the rate of spread in schools has been very, very low. Um, the rate of positive tests, I should say, in schools has been very, very low so far. People are scared, and they're scared because they, they've, they've seen what's happened in their communities. Well, let me end with one that's related question, but that I think uh, hopefully on a ho more hopeful note, um, <laughs> Dr. King, no, but around COVID as well too. And, and, and the attendees were interested in this as too. The education sector has obviously been forced to embrace and integrate new methods of teaching and learning due to COVID. Mm -hmm. I, I think the question is, a couple of questions here is, what practices do you can see, think will continue to be mainstays post COVID? And do you see any ways that really PK through 12 education, public education can emerge stronger out of the COVID pandemic. Technology, community partnerships. I think you talked a little bit about increased recognition of the importance of like early childhood earlier. You mentioned that, but are, are there any other ways that, that we come out of this um, a, a little bit stronger? Yeah, I'll give you four really quickly. So oh, four. Great. One, is, good. <laughs> one is we had a homework gap before COVID, right? Yep inequitable access to uh, the internet. Um, now we have real urgency around closing that. I hope we'll see some stimulus dollars that will help us to close that internet access gap. But, but we've got to get to a place where all kids and families have access to reliable high-speed internet. Before COVID, it's about 79% of white families, 66% of black families, 61% of Latino families that had reliable internet access. That's a gap we can and should close. Two, uh, we've seen the importance of relationships. And I think about the Phoenix Union School District in Arizona where they had an every student every day campaign to make sure every kid in the school district was in touch with at least an adult with the school district in the spring every day, right? And so we know that, that, that kids need those relationships with adults. And um, I think there's been an attention to that that I hope will last beyond this moment. Uh, third, uh, it shouldn't be that because you go to a school where they don't offer AP physics, you can't take AP physics. Right. If AP physics is offered somewhere else, you should be able to take it. And online. so hopefully yep. the online experience has lowered some barriers to opportunity. To access and opportunity. To access, yep. exactly. And then the last one is maybe a little bit like a little bit teacher teacher specific, but I think this moment has really required more student agency, right? Kids yeah. in the virtual or hybrid environment have to set goals. They have to plan their time. They have to ask questions when they need help. They have to act on feedback. They have to be self-directed in a way that maybe we didn't always ask of kids before. And I hope that student agency that we've cultivated during this period and that we've learned to cultivate during this period, I hope that will be something that sticks in our instructional approaches going forward. Those are great. Those are uh, those are a great answer, Dr. King. Those are four things that I, that I hope all come out of, um, of this, um, you know, very sort of ter terrible experiences that we're going through right now. Um, I just want to say thank you on behalf of the faculty, staff, and uh, students of, a of AU and the School of Education. Thank you very much. I'm going to pass it back to Cheryl. It's been a wonderful conversation. So thank you, Cheryl. Uh, right. Good to, to you. see you.
what can we say, but we're just deeply grateful for you, Dr. King, um, for spending time with us. It was such a rich, engaging conversation. And just want to say again, um, we want you to come back and 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 talk some more to us about uh, some of your big ideas. But I want to end there. Thank you so much. And everyone out there, please keep in touch with us. We have, we're starting our series. This was just the first of uh, three um, big ideas, uh, speakers that we will have this year. And, and I can't think, I don't know if it can get any better than it has today. You just dropped so much knowledge um, <laughs> on us, uh, Dr. King. So anyway, true. thank you all for coming out tonight and stay safe um, and um, just have a wonderful rest of your week. Thanks so much, thank be well, take Bye -bye. care.